My name is Holly Bernini. I'm Director of Development for the Goodnow Library Foundation. I'm thrilled to be here today to introduce and to celebrate Janice Corkin Rudolph in her most beautiful statue, Tree of Inspiration. Janice is an award-winning international artist, and lucky for us, she's a Sudbury resident who has deep ties to the community. Her works are permanently installed throughout New England, including Boston's Children's Hospital and Franklin Park Zoo, and thanks to Rudolph's generosity and the Robert Corkin, Lloyd Corkin Foundation, this library will now be home to two of her works. Her sculpture, An April Day, was installed in 2002 near the, our library's main entrance. In addition, Janice's sculptures are also displayed in private collections in Paris and Tokyo. Currently, she is working on a sculpture for the Wayland Garden Club, which will be installed at the front of the Wayland Library. And her sculpture, Venus, is now a part of the annual Meredith Sculpture Walk in New Hampshire. Thank you all so much for being with us here today. We are so happy to have you. Now I would like to introduce Sam Greenfield, our former Director of Development, and she can tell you about the Goodnow Library Foundation's renovation project that led to this magnificent piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. I'm Sam Greenfield, and I worked, let's see, we started this project to build the Sarah Sherman Now Lab, which you can't see, <laughs> uh, years ago with the help of Ken Vanna and the Sherman family. And when we came together at a party here at the library, Janice graciously said, how can I get involved? This sounds like a very exciting, creative endeavor, and I would love to help. Knowing her statue was beloved by the community, she donated this Tree of Life statue. She said she wanted to work to create a statue that would share the whole vision of the Sarah Sherman Now Lab. And you will see that vision when we unveil it. But was, that was amazing and generous of Janice. But then she went on to say, how can I help you fundraise for more of this project? She told me what she had done for a local zoo when she had sold tiles. So not only did Janice bring this idea to us, but the, she then said, I will help create the tiles and I will offer my studio space and teach people in the community how to make these artistic tiles. So for almost three years, Janice would open her studio, invite members of our community to come in, and with the purchase of a tile that she handcrafted, they would paint them. And it was so amazing. We watched families, grandparents, couples, book clubs, soccer teams, lacrosse teams. They would come into Janice's studio, create a piece of work of art. She would then turn it into a tile and uh, put it in her kiln. We then went back out to the community and said, okay, now we need to take these tiles and her statue and bring it to life in the library. Thanks to Ken Vanna again and Mike Precor for working together to build the base of the statue. Thanks to the Maxwell family for having a party to again promote this whole project. This whole piece of art became possible right here in the library, which is amazing. Not only that we got to this point, but for the future. I know as a Sudbury resident, I can't wait to walk in the library and see the Greenfield family tile and friends and other community members tiles right here in the library. So Janice, what you have given us is so beyond anything we could have ever imagined. It's, a, it's not only a piece of art, but it's a project that the whole community came together. And we are so grateful on behalf of the foundation. Thank you so much. And I wanna introduce Janice to come out and show you this magnificent piece of work. Thank you so much, Sam. I have to say it was such a pleasure for me to do this project. And I'm not only an artist, but a teacher, and I just love educating people. And, and especially turning people onto art and the process of art and sculpture or painting and how much fun it can be. And it was really so much fun um, working with all the different members of the community. And, and it, was, it was great. I, my studio is always open when anybody wants to learn art. Um, so this is called Tree of Inspiration. And I got the idea for the sculpture when we had that great big storm. I it was a couple of years ago. People from town probably remember that the town said we could put our branches along the front of our houses or our trees that had come down from the wind in the storm and they would remove everything for free. So I was driving around and I found this particular tree branch. 
I thought, oh, that will be perfect for my sculpture. And what I wanted to portray was three teens doing something that they always wanted to do and that they continue to do all their life for the most part. And uh, Sarah Sherman is one of the teens in sculpture and um, she is drawing a picture of a cardinal that's sitting on top of the sculpture of the tree. And then I have Yo-Yo Ma who was a classmate of my husband John Emery at, in the music department at Harvard University. Uh, I put him in as a teen and then I have a friend Yvonne Spicer, who I knew before she was mayor of Framingham, she worked for the Museum of Science, and she, I have her reading the book, The Color Orange, or is it The Color Purple, I think. Um, and now I will unveil the sculpture and tell you more about it as I, as you see it. Okay, so, um, let's see. This is, I, I failed this up myself, so I kind of easily know how to do this. Um, I have so many things I'm making out of this fabric. I'm making curtains out of it, and I'm going to make, I don't know, a dress or something. If anybody wants something, let me know, because there's so much of it. cello and here's Yvonne Spicer reading the color purple and here's Sarah Sherman um, drawing in her sketchbook when you get up close at a later time you'll see a picture of the cardinal that's at the top of the tree and when I found this branch I could just imagine the sculpture um, connected to the branch and I, I um, when I do sculpture, sculpture is something that fills up a space. So that's called the positive space. But then the negative space is what's between the space. Like this area here is negative space. And I had so much fun with this, doing the positive and negative space. When you, in the future, take a closer look, look at the negative and the positive space because the negative space makes a really nice design and the positive space is what's here. And that's true in every sculpture. Now here are the tiles that everybody made. Um, they go all the way around and there is a plaque that has everyone's name on it. And on the bottom it says, this is a gift from Robert Lloyd Corkin Foundation and Robert um, was my brother who died at an early age, suddenly, of an accident. And I have my name next to that as the sculptor. Um, and let's see. So what I'd like to tell you is that the first thing that the foundry did, I go to a foundry to have things made from clay to bronze. And um, the clay, I just brought a little with me. The clay is very soft, um, like this, and I squish it to make the form. And I have an armature. This is a head armature to do like a small portrait head, you know, three-dimensional, not on relief, which is, can also be done flat, but then raised like a coin is a relief when you see the different presidents on the coin um, or the buffalo. Look, at this, look to see the work that's done on it, it's very nice. 
So the clay goes over the armature. These were like stick figure armatures. And I made the figures over them. The, the cello was a little bit different. I don't think I had an armature in the cello. I think I just made it because it was a, that type of shape that could just be made. The tree, the, the foundry decided to cast it ahead of time because they thought that um, it was safer for the tree that way. And I'll show you an example of what happens. Let's say this was clay, okay, which it was, and I brought it to the foundry. What they do is they make a rubber mold. Now this is a mold from an opera sculpture I did called Violetta from La Traviata. And um, what they do, or this is called the lost wax process, so this is done all over the world. They take rubber, now it's hard, but it's kind of like epoxy where you have the two parts that are soft when you put them together, they become hard. Well, these two parts, when you put together, they become rubbery and they, they kind of cover everything. The rubber picks up every single detail and they put rubber over it. And then after the rubber is kind of floppy, so after they put rubber over it, they put a plaster, they put plaster. And this is all done with tools. It's all loose when they make it, and then it hardens afterward. Um, this Violetta, it says one out of three. Every sculpture has different, so and so many parts of, of a mold. Um, and after that's done, they melt wax. This is um, an example of the wax. And that goes inside the sculpture, that goes right in here, melted. And they kind of shake it around and then they pour it out so that it's about, oh, I don't know, a quarter of an inch thick or maybe a little, something like that. But then once it's poured out and hard, they take off the rubber and the plaster, and they have the positive, the clay gets recycled. Okay, and this is true for Degas' dancer, for Rodin's work, any bronzes. Okay, so they, they recycle the original clay, and then um, everything comes from the mold. Like Degas has 22 of his dancers all over the world, and that's called a limited edition and therefore it's not commercial. If you see works that are very inexpensive, it's because there are thousands of them, they're commercial. But um, anyway, so once you have the positive in wax, they have to fix the seams. For example, these are the seams and there might be extra wax in there and they have to really clean it up. It takes, it takes them a long time to do the lost wax process. And then once the wax is in the positive, they, let's say, let's say this is my sculpture. I mean, I'm just pretending I'm doing, it was going to be abstract, but now it's turning into like a head. I always seem to go to figurative or something. So let's say this is my sculpture. What they would do is they put a flower pot shape in wax on the bottom and, um, that way they can turn it upside down and they make sure that the bronze gets into every single part. They have things called sprues where they add extra pieces of wax to make sure like the hands and here they must have did a lot, done a lot of spruing to make sure that when they pour it, you don't have an arm minus a hand. And then after that, they put it in the kiln, a special kiln that melts out all of the wax. That's why it's called the lost wax process. So then um, I missed one step and that is before the wax goes in the kiln, it's dipped in a ceramic liquid. It always reminds me of cake batter because they have like this bowl about this big. It looks like a, like a, like a, cake bowl that you'd be making cake in, and it has a great big mixer. And it sort of looks like the color of yellow cake batter. And 
they dip it. They have a chart that tells you, depending on the weight, how many times you have to dip the sculpture, the, um, the wax into the ceramic liquid um, in order for it to hold. Actually, when I did my sculpture, Carmen, they miscalculated. It was a different foundry, but it was a great foundry. But I was wondering why it took them extra long to cast it, and the shell wasn't hard enough, so the whole thing fell through. So they did it again because they had the mold. But I, of course, I didn't have to pay extra for that. That was not my fault. But um, anyway, so once that, once everything is covered with the ceramic liquid, which becomes very hard and it's very, very strong because after the wax does melt out of the kiln, and that's when I realized I forgot that step, you have the ceramic shell that has every detail in it and they take it to where they pour bronze and they have a big pot of, well, it's, it's like up on a line, and they, these guys wear these suits, they, they look like space suits, and they tilt the bronze into the, the, the molten bronze into the um, ceramic shell. And they do that with every section, and then after that, you, they have to chip away all the shell, it takes a while, and then they have to weld all the pieces together. Right now, my sculpture for Wayland is in the welding process, so they're welding the pieces together. Um, and then they make any corrections, or I, all the way along, I give them input and make changes. In the wax, I always work on it, and then even in the bronze, I always ask them for changes, because there's always something I want to have a little differently. Um, so then they, after it's all welded together and all the changes are made so it looks just right, um, I pick a color for a patina. And the patina is the surface color. Sometimes you'll see sculptures that are blue or brown or black. Um, those are the main colors, or green. And um, this one I did a little unusual color, but I really was happy with the patina. Um, I thought it really looked great. So this is the sculpture and um, I hope you enjoy looking at it up closely. And also all the beautiful tiles everybody made. It was really so much fun having people paint that had never painted before. And um, it's fun to look at everything. And let's see. Know what else you'd like to know but I did start sculpting when I was in third grade when my family moved to Brookline we moved across the street from a sculptor and unlike my sister and brother I was immediately drawn to him and I spent all my free time there I helped him do things in the studio he gave me lessons and I had always wanted to be a sculptor and um, then later as I got older my dad said, you have to teach, you can't just sculpt. And I thought he was right, but I felt too shy, actually. People don't believe I used to be really shy, but um, I was. And so I started out volunteering for the School Volunteers of Boston. And I was working with a child in a classroom, and a woman from the art department, the Boston Public School Art Department, came up to me, and she said, do you know, you could be doing this and get paid. So she told me the steps. I, I didn't even notice her there because I was so involved with the student and the work. And that started off my um, teaching career, which I will do both things until I'm over 100. 105 is my goal. I, I have enough work in my brain right now to fill up all that time. And. Um, Thank you very much. It was really indeed a pleasure to do this and I hope everybody enjoys it and I hope they enjoy the library. Um, so much of my life I learned from books, not just from my teachers and I still do. And thank you again.
speechless, honestly. This is amazing. Um, we are so grateful to you, Janice. This is unbelievable. You're, you're speaking. I, I, a lot of um, knowledge and fun listening to hear the process. Um, the biggest revelation is that you're shy. I didn't know that. But besides that, um, we, we just can't say thank you enough. We, we are immensely grateful. And I would like to also thank you all from jo for joining us on behalf of the Goodnow Library Foundation. Thank you so much. <laughs>